Um, Lynn Jester, thank you so much. She brought to my attention that we, our videotapes of past meetings were not updating. And there is a problem, so thank you. Um, Greg is working on it, and he's working with YouTube, but he's, he's trying to fix it. So if you've tried to access the past meetings on our YouTube website, it should be fixed shortly. Um, if you have any questions or you continue to have problems, just email me, and I'll get that to Greg, and we'll get the video to you somehow. Okay, so he's fixing that right now. Thanks, Lynn. Anytime you see a problem like that, please let us know because I don't go check the videos. You know, that's just not something we're going to see. So always let us know, so I appreciate that. Um, we do not meet again for the next two weeks. So the uh, week before Christmas, the week before New Year's, we'll be back here January 6th. And right now we're scheduled to meet in here. Watch the email announcements, and they will tell you if there's a change. Three weeks from tonight is January 13th, and there was a handout by the door. Ashley, would you see if everyone got it? It's on the CTK letterhead. If you did not get it, raise your hand, and Ashley will bring it to you. Debbie, Shannon, the Turbits. Okay. Um, it had been on the schedule that in late November we were going to have the right of initiation and the right of welcoming. And it was just too early in the RCIA process to have it. So Father has scheduled it for January 13th. Um, this, the rituals in the church, and I've got enough priests and deacons who can correct me if I get this wrong, but it's... It's a formal way of acknowledging something of significance. In our secular lives, we have birthday parties, you blow out birthday candles. Marriages, you say, I do. We've had so many problems in the past few weeks in anticipating problems because people want to spend their Thanksgiving and Christmases observing their regular rituals. So even in our families, whatever, we have rituals that are important to us. The church has rituals. And it's a way of absorb, observing something significant. Your process of tending our CIA, we know the Lord has called you to be here. There's a reason you're here. There's a reason on a cold Wednesday night you're getting in your car and you're coming out to have ice water and bagged snacks. <laughs> um, so we observe the importance of recognizing the journey. And it's called the right of acceptance and the right of welcoming. I'm not going to go into a lot of the details on the right. I can go into that. We have a meeting January 6th, and I'll go into more detail then. But I want you to get on your calendars January 13th. We're going to meet in the church, and Father Eric will go through the right with you. So those of you who are looking to come into the church, whether you've never been baptized or you've been baptized in a religion other than the Catholic Church, we'll be looking at you going through the rite. If you have a sponsor, invite your sponsor to come that night. If you have family members who are supportive and interested, invite them to join you that night. Traditionally, this is held during a Mass, but with the COVID issues, to bring in a crowd of people to a, to a mass that's already socially distanced is difficult. And so with this group really getting to know each other, I, it'll be nice just having us. But you're welcome to bring anyone. They can leave after the right, which will take the first 10 or 15 minutes. They can stay. Father Eric will be talking that night on marriage and holy orders. So, you know, if you bring your spouse, then that would be a good night for them to stay and hear about the sacrament of marriage. But anyway, just generally, there's two things. This letter that Father Eric has written to you, he had a conflict tonight, otherwise he would be here. The big issue in this is towards the bottom, he's included six questions. 
And these are questions for you over the next couple of weeks to spend some time praying about, to spend some time pondering and seeing where is this journey, where is this time that I've spent already leading me. Um, and there's no right answer or wrong answer. There is no yardstick. It's just reviewing what's gone on with you and the growth in your relationships with the Lord, with each other over the past time. I really like what he says in here. Participating in the ceremonies before joining the church means committing to continuing the journey. It's not taking the final step. So what we want you to do is spend some time over the next couple of weeks praying over these questions, thinking about them, seeing where you are, and then seeing do you feel prepared to stand up and say, I'm ready to continue with this journey. If you're not ready, keep coming to the classes. This is not an end to anything. It's just recognizing y'all are making a significant part of your journey. Um, I don't like surprises, so let me tell you in the right what will be being said. The first question, oh, thank you, Father. The first question you'll answer is, what is your name? That's easy. The second question is, what do you ask of God's church? And the answer is faith or something similar. You might have a different way of saying it, but basically you're asking for faith. And then the third question is, what does faith offer you? And the canned answer is eternal life. So, so there's no surprises as to what you would be saying in the right. Those are the primary three questions and generally what the answer would be. Okay? With that, we have January 6th, we can talk about it again. We can talk about sponsors at that time. Um, your mentor people who have already met with you, they will be contacting you somewhere around New Year's or something like that. We want to give you a week or two to pray over these questions. And then they're going to contact you just for a telephone conversation and see, do you have any questions? Do you, is there anything that I can help you with with this? And just kind of make sure you're just comfortable with it, okay? And that is my five minutes. Does anyone have any questions? Man, that's great. <laughs> okay, Father Bashkar is our speaker for our prayer tonight. And after that, Father Taryn will be speaking on the people of God. Thank you all. Merry, Merry Christmas to each of you. Stay safe and prayerful. Okay? Take this sheet. Good evening, all of you. Hearty welcome to the prayer service theme People of God. You shall be my people, I will be your God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The grace and peace of God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. We have been called by God to, ease, to do his work, to walk with our brothers and sisters, who seek the risen Lord, and want to learn about the Catholic faith. It is a privilege to do so. Let us call on that same God to be with us now. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, from age to age, 
you have gathered a people to yourself you sent prophets to sustain your covenant with your chosen people you sent your son to redeem us and to tell us of your great love he sent disciples to preach the good news of our salvation and countless men and women have since borne witness to this truth give us then the grace to share our faith with others to explore your sacred word to teach the truths of our catholic doctrine and to pray more fervently renew your gift of life within us and instill in us a deeper appreciation of our own baptism and confirmation and a greater reverence for the eucharist for in your word and sacraments you continue to save your people we ask this through christ our lord now we have the scripture reading the reading from the first letter of st peter chapter 2 verses 9 to 10 but you are a chosen people a royal priesthood a holy nation god's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light once you were not a people but now you are the people of god once you had not received mercy but now you have received mercy i want to all of you to read the scripture once again by your own please see the questions for reflection the first question as you are going to become god's people through the sacrament of baptism do you be faithful to god always by keeping his commandments and saying no to evil all the time and keep yourself holy because we are called to be holy since the god is holy let us reflect about this question let us reflect about the second question whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me are you willing to bear the daily crosses 
of your life for the sake of Christ and put Christ the center of your life let us reflect about the third question go into the, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation as people of god we are sharing the ministry of jesus christ to proclaim the gospel to all people do you preach the gospel to the people whom you meet through your words and deeds by witnessing to christ's love and forgiveness as we conclude let us all together say the prayer of saint francis assisi let us all together say lord make me an instrument of your peace where there is hatred let me sow love where there is injury pardon where there is doubt faith where there is despair hope where there is darkness light where there is sadness joy o divine master grant that i may not so so much seek to be consoled as to console to be understood as to understand to be loved as to love for it is in giving that we receive it is in pardoning that we are pardoned it is in dying that we are born to eternal life amen the lord be with you may almighty god bless you and protect you from all evil and bring us to everlasting life in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit good evening Am I on, am I mic'd or not? Okay, all right, good. I couldn't tell if it was just the natural echo of the room or if I was live. So um, good to be with you as always uh, here at the RCIA class and um, to be speaking with you this evening about the people of God. And so last week we heard about the church and you may be thinking the church, the people of God, isn't that kind of the same thing? That kind of crossed my mind as well when I saw the topics. So hopefully we'll be able to parse those things out really well and understand what the difference is. 
uh, between those two things. And I just recently started reading, I uh, probably should have done this sooner, uh, so I'm a little late to the game, but I started reading Pope Francis's encyclical uh, Fratelli Tutti, and I'm probably going to use it for a class next semester. And it really coincided, I think, rather nicely, even though the subject is different, uh, with the topic, the people of God. Because one of the big themes in that book, and in many other encyclicals as well, is the problem that we have as a society with individualism, right? Thinking of everything at very, very individualistic terms. It's just part of our economy. It's part of the very modern tradition in which we are formed more or less unconsciously very often. And it makes it harder for us to think of ourselves as a people because we become accustomed to seeing ourselves mainly as individual units, you know, to a greater or lesser degree. And so when we think of the phrase, the people of God, it can be challenging because it's calling us to relate to God, not simply in, as individual believers, but as members of a people. And this would have been, you know, less counterintuitive in previous ages, right? It would have been certainly less counterintuitive to a biblical mentality. And so the challenge for us is to try to place ourselves more in the biblical mentality. It's not that individualism is 100% negative, right? It has its positives. It can certainly be a spur to creativity, to innovation, all sorts of things like that. But it can also make it harder for us to see how it is that we are to relate as church, as people of God in the plan of salvation. And so uh, I want us to begin then by thinking about how it is that God relates primarily to people in Scripture. So we're going to take a very big backward step all the way back to the book of Genesis. And we remember that, of course, God creates, creates the cosmos. And within that, the crown of his creation is Adam. And there's a relationship between God and Adam. Certainly it starts off pretty individualistic in that sense, right? Not really, because Adam, of course, is completely defined by relationship to God who we then, as Revelation develops, learn is himself a union of persons. But putting that aside for just a moment, Adam relates to God, but then very shortly after, what does God do for Adam? He creates a person to be with him. He says it's not good for the man to be alone. And so he creates Eve, and they enter into a covenant relationship with God a relationship that is defined by trust. And so in this relationship, Adam and Eve, there's obedience, but it's an obedience that is entered into in complete openness. Right? They trust God entirely. There's a gentleness, a love in the union between the two of them and God. And covenant means that they themselves as a couple have this relationship of ongoing openness to God. And we know how that story goes, right? That Adam and Eve are tempted, and when they're tempted by the serpent, the serpent plants suspicion in their minds. Suspicion is never particularly good for relationship, right? You start to think, oh, this other person has ulterior motives. Well, this is what Satan says to them about God. You remember, they were prohibited from eating fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the serpent says, well, why doesn't God want you to do that? Maybe, maybe, you know, if you did that, it would make you more powerful and God would feel threatened by you, right? God's trying to keep something good from you because he wants to have all the power in this relationship. So there's this suspicion that begins to creep in. And Adam and Eve, well, maybe there's something to that. And so they, of course, as you know, they follow through with what the serpent tempts them, what Satan tempts them to do, and they bite into the fruit. And when God comes looking for them in the evening, as he did every evening, they're hiding. Because where there's trust, there's openness. Where there's suspicion, we close down. And now they're thinking primarily about themselves, their own, what's in this for me? Right? The individuality begins to assert itself in a negative way. Right? And so God comes, and they say, well, we know what he saw, we were naked, and so we hid. Well, that had never been a problem before. Right? But this symbolically shows us that there's not trust there anymore. And the covenant has been broken, where that trust has been broken. They decide they have, instead of having that trust, there is a spirit of rebellion. Right? A spirit that says you can usurp God and become God yourself. 
And so something there is severely broken. That starts, of course, the narrative that will carry us through the Old Testament. And that narrative is the restoration of what is broken there in Eden. Now, Adam and Eve, are, they're sent out into the wilderness to toil, right? Basically, de the devil says to them, you can make it on your own, and it's kind of like God gives them what they ask for. You, you can live without God, but not really, right? In a way, they, he does, because they have to go out and, in fact, you know, provide for themselves in the heat of the day, you know, bear children, the pain that comes with that. And yet God still doesn't let them go. He continues to try to call humanity, or does call humanity, into relationship, and he does that primarily through the nation of Israel, who he calls out of Egypt. And again, he doesn't just call Moses or Aaron or some particular person and then say, gather together some like-minded people and we'll, you know, we'll have kind of a, a loose union of people and I'll relate to each of them individually within that, you know, kind of a uh, you know, loose association. No, he calls a nation calls a nation out of Egypt, and begins to reveal himself through that nation's leaders, through its prophets, reveals himself to the nation, and that nation becomes a covenant people with God. A covenant is made through Moses. We, 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 I'm kind of skipping over the part about Noah. There's also a covenant with Noah, right? But we, we'll, we'll go a little light on some of the details here. But primarily the revelation that we see being made in the Old Testament is being made through a nation. And so salvation comes to the nation of Israel, and you see that all through Scripture. You see it in the Psalms. Save your people when they're in exile. Save your people. Restore your people. God will come to save us. There's us thinking, and not people just within nation thinking about themselves and how this, being a member of this nation might be useful to them or help them to know God but they're very much bound to and identified with it. But that nation, as time goes on, one of the developments that happens is that God wants to teach the nation that it doesn't just exist for itself. They, as a people, Israel, are meant to exist to reveal the glory of God to the wider world. And as you read through the Old Testament, that you start to see that theme becoming more and more pronounced. That becomes the prophetic word that comes to them. You're supposed to minister to the outcast, to the, the stranger, the widow, the orphan. Make God's glory known to the world. Right? So God is calling them to be an agent of reconciliation, not just for themselves as a people with God, but to the world at large, broken through disobedience, broken through the sin of Adam and Eve, through original sin. Right? So that, that is, you know clear, I think, to the people of Israel, right? This wasn't necessarily something they had to adjust their minds to the way maybe we do. They were a people, and they were a holy people called, set apart, a peculiar people they were called, set apart from the world, but not so that the world could just go its own way to, to disaster, but so that the world itself ultimately could be redeemed. Skip forward to Christ, who comes to us through the nation of Israel, through a Jewish woman, Mary, and Joseph, his foster father, is born to that nation, grows up growing to, going to the synagogue, reading in the synagogue. You know, they, when uh, Mary and Joseph lose track of him on their trip to Jerusalem, we know that when they eventually track him down, he's in the, he's in the temple. And he's doing the teaching, of course, because uh, he's the son of God, right? Uh, not that the people of the temple knew that, but he's there and... He is absorbing and sharing the word of God. And so the people of Israel are waiting as a nation for a culmination. They're captive people, as they had been through their history at various points. Now the captor happens to be the Roman Empire, and they're waiting on a figure who will come and restore them as a nation, restore them to glory, a Messiah. Right, so... That's what binds them as a people, is that hoped-for future. Christ comes, the anointed one. It's not what they, they expected, necessarily. Certainly, they didn't expect he'd be the Son of God, right? But he comes, 
and he reveals himself to be through his miracles, through his words of preaching, through the love that he shows, to be that Messiah who is coming to restore Israel to God, but beyond that, to reach out beyond Israel and gather in the nations through the whole world, which is why we're all sitting here tonight. And that gradually unfolds in, in the New Testament just as it gradually unfolds in the Old Testament. So in the Old Testament, yes, it's very Israel-centric, and then you begin to see an expansion outward, like in Isaiah, for example. Everyone will come to the Holy Mountain, Isaiah says. In the New Testament, it's kind of the same. There's a passage that kind of takes you off guard where a woman comes to Jesus, and he, at first he just seems like he's going to turn her away because she's one of the Gentiles. No, I came for the house of Israel, he says. And he, she says, but even the dogs receive the scraps from the master's table. And he says, great is your faith. And we begin to see in the New Testament that mirror image where now the light is breaking open from the first hearers who are of the house of Israel to the nations themselves, to the Gentiles as they were called, to the Samaritans, to the outcast. But it comes through a people, and that people who will be gathered for the purpose of shedding that light to the nations will be those who are called out. The ecclesia is what that means, to be called out. The word we use, the church, the people of God. And so as Catholics, we see ourselves very much as a people, the people of God, it is called, a house built of living stones. And we're set apart, but we're set apart not to be insular and inward-looking, but to be outward-looking, to be here for the salvation of the world, to be salt and light, to use the familiar image. So we, we are a people. Now, I remember I had a, uh, when I was in for, uh, formation, before I entered the diocese, I uh, was discerned with a religious order called the Society of Mary. And I remember that um, one of our formators there said, sometimes we hear the phrase, the people of God, and as Americans, our minds tend to jump to we the people. Right? When we hear the word the people, we, you know, we, we think that may be the resonance that that has. right? And so it, when that happens, though, the problem is that sometimes we, the people of the United States, see ourselves kind of, you know, as recipients mainly of rights, of individual rights, you know, over and against the government. That's just kind of one way in which we can be formed historically. In the church, we, the people, are bound very closely to the whole, not just in this particular geographical area, but globally to the whole people of God around the world, and we approach it not primarily as people petitioning for our rights, although we do have rights as people of God. We have rights to the sacraments, for example. We have rights to, to, to step quite a bit, right, as members of God's church. But we come primarily asking, how is it that I can become a sign of holiness among the people of God? What is it that I'm supposed to be doing here to make the church the church? to make God visible to the world. You know, Father Eric said last week, the church is here to make visible the mystery of God. And what is, what is it that I'm going to be doing to make that happen? And so, you know, in that way, we are very aware that the role we play in the body of Christ as, as members of that body is crucial for the church to be what it's called to be in the world. This is why we have confession, right? Because whenever I sin, even if it's privately, it has that ripple effect to the body. One part of the body cannot be unwell and leave the rest intact. And so there's re ongoing reconciliation that has to happen between myself and the body of Christ, right? That, again, thinking of ourselves as members of that, but having, uh, the, the jargon here is odd extra versus odd intra. Odd extra thinking is facing outward towards the world, that is, I'm not called to be a member of the people of God so I can spend my life involved in church politics, right? Or kind of inward-looking uh, quarrels within the church that can sometimes arise. Or even, not necessarily quarrels, but just kind of internal affairs. Those internal affairs, you know, the running of a parish or a diocese are necessary, but it's all for the sake of what is odd extra, what is facing towards the world. So what, are, what are, are the marks of the people of God? Well, last week, Father Eric told us that there are three marks of the church. Can anyone remember what those are? 
We'll do a, a little impromptu, a little pop quiz here. I heard one. That's right, right. One holy Catholic apostolic. Yeah, four marks. Sorry, I'm, I don't count well, apparently. There are three marks tonight. I got them confused. One holy Catholic apostolic. Well, there are three marks of the people of God. And, you know, they're parallel. All right, that's what I would kind of focus on uh, this evening. So we're one holy Catholic apostolic. That tells us about the nature of the church as a whole, our unity, the way, in fact that we can trace the, ourselves to the apostles, the universality or Catholicity, the holiness. The marks of the people of God are the same as the marks that, that the way that we identify Christ and the way that Israel was identified. And those marks are as follows. We are a priestly people, we're a prophetic people, we are a kingly people. Christ, we say, was priest, prophet, and king. Israel was a priestly people. Israel was prophetic, or was called to be. Israel was kingly. So it is for the people of God, the church. Now let's talk a little bit about what those things mean. What does it mean to be priest, prophet, and king? Because when you're baptized, when you enter the church, you receive those marks. You become, or are called to be, priest, prophet, and king in your role in the church, in the people of God. So let's just start with the first one, priest. Now obviously Israel was a priestly people because they had priest, a priesthood, the Levites, or the Levitican priesthood. Right? And so the Levitican priesthood, what was their primary role in mediating between the nation of Israel and God? What did they do? Like in the temple. Sacrifice. Yes, in the holy place, in the temple. So, you bring your animals in. It's a big thing, right? You sacrifice bulls, you know, the doves, whatever, you know, the animals they would bring on the altar. And this was part of an ongoing relationship with God of atonement. But what is a priest doing there? Well, he's bridging the gap between God and humanity, and that gap exists because of sin, right? So sacrifice is there to bring about that reconciliation with God. So obviously they're priests, but then the people themselves are a priestly people, not just a people who have priests in their midst, but they're called to be a priestly people who then, going back to the outward-facing call that Israel has, they're called as a people to begin the process of bridging the relationship between God and humanity. That's what priests, that's what it means to be priestly. So in the Catholic Church, we have, a, like, like Israel, we have altar, we have priest, but with big difference, because when sacrifice occurs on the altar in the church, what is the sacrifice that's offered? Not of rams and bullocks, right? But of the, of the Lamb of God himself, of Christ. That is made that sacrifice that is made once and for all, but is present continually through the mystery of eternity's intersection with time, is made continually present on the altar. Rams and bullocks cannot heal the gap between us and God. They, there was an atonement that kind of rolled the, the nation forward, rolled sins forward for another year. How is it that that gap can be brought, can fully be closed, that wound be healed, can be closed? Only God Himself can do that. And so he did by becoming man, by becoming you know, a human being and offering himself in sacrifice and making that sacrifice present till the end of time. All right, so when we come to church, the priest goes then to the altar and through the Holy Spirit, he offers that sacrifice every day back to the Father to reconcile us once again to God. God reconciling us to God, that's what it is. But it's not supposed to stop there, right? When you're Catholic, that, that is the amazing thing that you get to experience. I mean, every time you walk into Mass, 
But what, is this, what do we say at the end of Mass? Go forth. Because just as Israel wasn't just a nation with priests in its midst, we're not supposed to be just a people who have a priesthood, but we're meant to be a priestly people. So now we are called to go out, having been fortified by the Eucharist, and go about the work of reconciling the world to God. And that happens in a lot of different ways, right? But that's overall the thing that makes us a priestly people. We're supposed to make it, to put it in another way, we're supposed to make the world holy. You know, Father Eric said, holiness, God working through us. Well, God works through us if we are receiving and open to what we receive in the Eucharist, all the graces that we receive there in the sacrament of reconciliation, then those graces make us holier, and then we, salt light of the world, can do that uh, as well, can uh, shed that light in the, in the surrounding reality. You know, I as a priest, I can just, you know, I mean, it's true, if, as long as I go up there and say the words right, the, sac- the Eucharist happens and people receive. And I could just take it in a very rote way. Well, you know, objectively, I celebrated a valid Mass, and so people received the body of Christ. I did my job as a priest. Is that, is that how I'm supposed to approach that? No, <laughs> right? No, if I'm not being made holy by it, if I'm not you know, also doing my job to bring people to God, you know, if it just becomes mechanical, and it's the same way for us all. Prophetic people. Israel, we know, had prophets. And often the, the prophets were ad intra, right? They were having to say to Israel, you're doing it wrong, right? You're not doing what God called you to do. Get back in line. But Israel itself was meant to be there to give a prophetic word as well by its witness, by the way it it behaved differently. Prophets are people who burst onto the scene, usually highly unusual people, people very much out of the ordinary, who call us to a higher way of life, who often have to tell us where it is that we've gone astray and pull us back. But having been pulled back into a right relationship with God, Israel then was meant to be a witness of what that looks like. And the same thing is true of the church. Christ himself played a prophetic role. He wasn't just a prophet, but he was certainly prophetic because he came to call Israel back to God and ultimately the nations as well. Right? And so we as prophetic people, well, we are there to speak the word that the world might not necessarily want to hear because often it is a word of chastisement. It's not really our word, it's the word that God gives us to pass that on, but it's for the benefit of the world, right? It's not to stand there as you kind of righteously judging. And there are a lot of different ways that that gets done. You know, we, uh, one of the most prominent ministries we have as a church is the pro-life ministry. That's one way in which the church is prophetic. It's there as a reminder that there's life here and life is sacred and we're not treating it as such. Stand up for the interest of the poor and the marginalized in our midst, the immigrant. Right? These are all ways in which the church has a prophetic voice in the world. We're a prophetic people. A sign of contradiction is the way that Christ is described. And so we kind of come at you know, kind of a sharp angle sometimes to the world because the world is always in need of repentance and reconciliation to God. We are too. And so the the church then isn't going to fall neatly in line with all the ideologies that have captured our society because it's a prophetic witness. It's there to speak the prophetic word to the society as a whole, as it is laid out in Scripture, as it is laid out in the great tradition of the church. And so as a people, we are not bound by, no, no, we, we belong to no one but God. We're not beholden to party. We're not beholden to you know, any particular tribal configuration. We might belong to those things, right, and, and have our part in them. But first and foremost, we belong to God as a people. And that's to be our primary identity. You know, and this, uh, when I think about you know, what it means to be a people. I think this is a burning question in our society and one in which we can play this prophetic role because ours is a society where people find it hard to feel like they belong to anything or anywhere. 
And one way that gets played out is that people become really, you know, incredibly fervent about their political faction that they belong to, or whatever other kind of identity group maybe that they found, subcultures that proliferate, because it gives them a sense of belonging. We know in our bones that we're not just supposed to be out on our own in the world, that we're supposed to belong to something. And if the church lets itself become just kind of factionalized, then we kind of lose our prophetic witness as people who are set aside, who are called apart to be priestly, to be holy, in a way that only belonging to God can do for us. All right, so that, that one way in which that could be a powerful witness is because people are sensing that uh, an extreme individualism leaves you per- radically unsatisfied. And the church says, well, you're right, because you're meant to belong to something that is itself a unity that is constituted by God and that brings us to God and in union with one another. So the third thing then, we are a kingly people. Israel had kings, we know, as well as prophets. It was a point of contention at one point whether they would have kings. But what is it that a king does? And by the way, one, before I let this slide pass my mind, you'll notice that these three different types of people all have something in common. Priest, prophet, and king. And that is they are anointed for their role. Anointed or they do the anointing as the prophet would anoint the king of Israel. Anointed uh, Saul, anointed David, right? Samuel would do that. Kings are anointed as priests are anointed. I don't know if any of you have seen the, uh, the series, very popular series, The Crown. Has anyone... Yeah, <laughs> I got two hands waving back there. Well, you remember the episode where Elizabeth has her coronation then. I show this to my students. I liked it so much. The House of Formation. Yeah, well, uh, clips. Not the whole episode. Not the whole episode. I didn't slack off that much. But we were, you know, the, the, and it did connect to the class, all right. Uh, but there, there is a wonderful episode. Where is, where is when, when a new monarch in England is anointed or coronated, where do they do it? Do they do it in the Houses of Parliament? No. Some public, no, they do it in a church. Westminster Abbey, that's where the chair is. And it's a really wonderful scene because you have the choir, you have the choir singing all creep, not all creatures of our God and King, but all people who on earth do dwell. Right, they're singing that in the Abbey. There's a procession with the Archbishop, you know, and, and of our Canterbury, you know, Anglican, of course. And then there's a wonderful scene where you see his thumb with the oil kind of slowly dripping off and it gets caught by the sunlight. It's really beautifully shot. And you realize This is a religious thing. To be a king is a religious designation. It's not just a designation of prestige or power, or to be a queen in this case. It is to be set apart, and it's to be set apart to rule. What does it mean to rule? Well, to rule properly, to be a king properly, is to rule for the benefit of your subjects. In classical philosophy, the distinction between a king and a tyrant is that a king rules for the benefit of his people. A tyrant just rules for himself and, and takes advantage of the people for his own benefit. That's the difference. And I think one of the nice things about the crown is you see Elizabeth's very earnest about her, that, no, this is, this is not about me. Or her um, Queen Mary you know, sends her this letter that now you belong to the crown. You know, it's very serious. You know, that this, this is it, what you do, you do for the crown, but by the crown she meant for the scepter and isle, right, for the, the people of England. And so again, it's to be set apart, but not to exalt yourself. And all of that pomp and circumstance that goes with royalty is not meant to be about the royals, it's meant to be about the, the nation, right, the, to the, the kind of the, the glory of, of the nation. And when people start to think it's about them, that's when it all goes wrong. And I think the show's pretty good at showing that when they become self-absorbed, things go badly. And that's true of the kingly people of Israel as well, right? When they begin to see it primarily as to to their own benefit, it's all about exalting themselves, or when a particular king, like Saul, for example, begins to think of it that way, things go badly. That they're anointed for that role, uh, just as a priest is. And then, if they're going to be kings, then they have to always give their lives. You know, I mean, it's supposed to be 
it's religious in that sense, right? They're supposed to pour out their lives for the good of the people. And, um, and that's, you know, you're always so tempted to take advantage of the prestige that goes with those roles to serve yourself. But that's not the way, right? That's not the way it's supposed to be. And so um, you, then you become a tyrant if you let that happen, right? Or, or at least uh, something that is not what you're called to be. So we as kingly people, we might ask, well, all right, so we are set apart. It's not that hard to see how we're set apart to bring holiness to the world by bridging the gap between God and humanity. By the way, I skipped over this, but the, wo- the word for priest from Latin is pontifex, bridge builder, which is where we get the word pontiff for the, the pope. Right? He's the bridge builder between God and humanity. Right? So we can, we can see how that works. We can see how prophetic witness works. How are we to be kings in this world? Well, that sounds pretty exalted. That's what we're called to be. Well, we're called to be that because we recognize God has called us to live lives of service. Right? That we are set apart for that. We might think of, you know, reading uh, the encyclical, how it is that just our... our your regular jobs that we do in the world can be thought of differently when we see them from the perspective of service. You run a business. How is it that you are a leader that works for the benefit of people within your sphere, your employees, your customers? You know, sometimes the economy is especially where we get caught up in individualistic thinking. I'm doing this for myself, and if it has a social benefit, that's just incidental. That's the old, you know, kind of way of thinking about it, right? But if you are intentional and you recognize that I'm a leader in this, this place in, in the world, it might not be big on the map, but it doesn't mean it's not big because you can bring salt and light there. When people realize, I, you know, I serve my customers well because I actually care about my customers. It's not just because I don't want to get a bad, uh, zil- now I can't think of any of the services. What are the, the various online apps you rate, you know, the business you went to? Uh, you know, I don't want to get badly rated on Zillow or whatever it's called. <laughs> I can't think of the name. What's that? Yelp. Yelp, yes, thank you. You know, I want to get a bad Yelp review, right? I mean, of course, yeah, that's part of it. I'm not saying it isn't. But I actually show care for the customer. I show care for my employees. Boy, what a big difference that makes. And what, what an example that can start to set, that ripple effect can spread out when you start to practice it that way. That's one way to be a kingly people. Right? We think of our role in society, if you were to become a politician, you know, um, God bless you, you know. <laughs> if you were to do that, then what, what, may, what difference it makes if you really and truly are doing it for the good of the people that you want to represent in Congress, your state Congress or national. Right? That's to be kingly as well. A lot of the stuff that Queen Elizabeth does day to day is pretty mundane. I mean, for all of the pomp and circumstance that goes with it, she's mainly just out there cutting ribbons, it seems like. But there's an example of caring for the people. And I'm not here to preach monarchism to you, all right? But you know, it, it is a good image of what, that, what it means to be truly, uh, to truly take that status seriously. And, and how even though day to day what we might be doing seems like it's not, you know, does it match the glamour we think of when we think of a, of a crown head estate? Was well, precisely in the mundane, everyday things that we can uh, show how you know, life can be lived differently and how God's care for people can, be, can reach out in the small things. So this, this is all, you know, um, the ways in which as we enter into the body, the body of Christ in the world, as we go receive the sacraments and go out into the world, that we make visible the mystery of God. And one of the, of the things that you know, is revealed you know, in Christ, that is revealed in the New Testament, God relates to people this way because this is God's nature himself. God's nature himself is to be a unity of persons. I remember when I came and talked about the Trinity, I you know, hammered this, I think. That God himself is not, we don't think of him as an isolated unit, so to speak. But God himself is the eternal, loving union of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Is a community, if you will, and yet perfectly one. And so it is supposed to be with the church. Because we're made in God's image. We're made for communion. We're made for union. 
which nevertheless doesn't abolish our individuality. Just as in, the, in God, we can, we, we can identify the three persons while acknowledging that they are one. We too, we bring our special gifts to the role of priest, prophet, and king, which we're anointed to. We bring our particular quirks and personalities. We're not, we don't all kind of melt into an indistinguishable mass. And yet all those things are brought for the benefit of those to whom we've been joined. And in turn, for those who we haven't been joined with yet, the world out there at large. You know, that we're not supposed to just say, okay, well, now I'm safely in the church and the world around me. I try to step away from that as much as possible. The primary vocation of the laity is to be in the world. The priests, too, were to be in the world, too. But very often, as priests, a lot of our work becomes absorbed in the workings of the church. But the primary role of the laity is to be Christ in the world. Laity just comes from the word for, guess what? People. From the Greek word for people. And so you are the people of God out there doing the priestly work of the church, doing the prophetic work of the church, being kingly in the various ways that God calls you to be that. And as they say, as Archbishop, um, or Ful as Bishop Fulton Sheen used to say, if every Catholic lived up to their call, we transform the world in ways that are unimaginable. And this is uh, definitely something I try to remind myself of, uh, you know, but if you were doing everything you were called to do as a priest, what, what, what an amazing you know, difference that would make, and it's true for us all. So I'll pause there. Well, give us a breather here. Just give you some time to reflect. I mean, are there any questions or thoughts that you have about that? I know we'll get to divide up into our tables, but... Pope Francis, in his encyclical, he likes to use the example of the Good Samaritan. And I think that does kind of sum up all of this pretty well. Because the Good Samaritan, number one, he's the, one of the signs that Christ is reaching out to the, to the nations. The Samaritans being pretty poorly thought of in Israel. But the way the Samaritan goes about doing good in the world, he can't do it all by himself. No one has to have an innkeeper to look after the guy while he goes off to get help. Right? He becomes a model for how it is that we work together as a people for the benefit of the world. And so that is how Jesus says we can recognize our neighbor as the people that we're responsible for and with the help of God can bring to, uh, to that reconciliation, that covenant that we have through Christ and that is sealed by Christ's blood and brings us to God. Thank you.